We're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, and I'm a Partnerships Manager here at All Voices, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Today, I'm excited to welcome our next guest, Karine Onyaju. She is the Lead Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and People Operations um, at Ada Support. Karine, how are you? Hi, I'm doing very well, thank you. Hopefully, you're doing well today, too. Yes, I'm excited that we are at the end of the week and excited to be speaking uh, with you today on the interview series. If you want to kick us off by sharing a little bit about yourself, including your pronouns and what has recently brought you joy, this can be anything. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So my name is Kareen. Uh, the pronouns that I use are she, her, and hers. And something that has recently brought me joy um, probably my roommate. Uh, she's my best friend and she never fails to make me laugh. And she had me in tears like an hour ago. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. I think the place that you live and the people you surround yourself with, they're so important. So that's a great answer. Yeah, most definitely. What has really led to your diversity, equity, and inclusion work? What is your uh, why for getting into the space? Yeah, great question. So for me, I think growing up in a predominantly white neighborhood and community, I started to question why my teachers, managers, uh, even people I would interview with, why they didn't look like me. I yeah. didn't see black women um, and black leaders in those positions. And I think it led me to really questioning and thinking about how I could get involved and volunteer in learning more about some of the, even the internalized racism that um, I suppose that I, there were in my own thoughts. So during university, I was really lucky to be able to volunteer for a few student service centers, mm -hmm. uh, including a woman student service center, a gender and sexuality resource center, as well as a, another student service center, which was race, uh, ethnicity, and culture. And this was the first time that I had even heard of diversity and inclusion. Um, and I think from volunteering, I, I really, it opened my eyes to seeing, hey, there is an opportunity to learn more and to give yourself your own self-assessment of what DI means to you. Yeah. Also gave me the opportunity to create programming for students and events in which I also were able to learn so much from. Um, and I think that's what really drove me to learn about, hey, how is it that I could work in doing this for a living? Is this something that exists? Um, so I'm just feel really fortunate that it brought me all the way to Ada now. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think, you know, what you said about predominantly white spaces, whether it's interviews, schools, teachers, tech is definitely no different. And representation has come a long way, but there's still a lot that needs to be improved. Um, you know, there's a lot of research out there, but built in recently released a study and only 26% of computing related or technical jobs are held by women and the numbers get even bleaker when we narrow it down to women of color. 3% are held by black women specifically. What are your thoughts around how companies can really increase this, these stats? We know that, you know, um, a lot of companies are talking about um, retaining and promoting, but also attracting um, talent from underrepresented communities. So always like to, to ask there. Yeah, no, this is a great point. What's very interesting about some of the articles that I've read or similar studies about the lack of representation of Black women in technology mm -hmm. is always about that, it, that in itself. Yeah. Um, I don't see a lot of articles that will point to uh, organizations or Black and tech organizations uh, that should be highlighted, which is really unfortunate. And uh, from an organizational perspective, I really think an organization needs to think about, hey, what are our own hiring practices? What are the steps that I can do today, not in 2030, not in the years beyond that, that will actually make Black women feel welcomed and included in the workplace, heard, promoted, <laughs> valued. So there really needs to be a full, almost rediscovery of not just addressing it as a problem, but really breaking down and deconstructing, okay, what is it that I can do today to make sure that this is something that our organization can help with or be maybe a change leader in, in fixing some of these issues, right? And then the second part is really about partnerships and advocacy. Like I mentioned, we should really be working with these organizations um, that are specifically for Black and tech leadership and women and trying to think about, okay, 
what are we doing that um, we can do today that maybe will help boost them? Um, can we partner with them and drive that change? I think that just makes a huge difference and it's not something that has come up often in conversations. It's typically in my experience, just about the problem itself and saying that's so unfortunate, it's so sad. And right. leaving it at that, yeah. Yeah, I think there are tangible steps that we can take, especially as if you're not as an organization recruiting right now or you're not hiring you know, 100 people tomorrow, you can't just say like you have this whole pipeline of talent if you don't build those relationships and you don't have those partnerships already, you're not creating a strategic plan similar to a product or service of, of a company as well. You need to really be specific and be intentional with it. So I definitely agree with you. Um, and there are amazing partners out there who have access to talent and pipeline and it's just really, really important to act on it um, as well. Um, I know in your kind of bio, it kind of mentioned that you worked at other organizations as well, such as uh, H&M and Levi Strauss for over six years and saw the implementation of diversity, equity, and inclusion programs um, that were fully embraced. But of course, you know, with any large changes or a shift in processes, there's inevitably conflict. Can you share a little bit how did you mitigate these internal employee conflicts? Yeah, and what's interesting about working at both H&M and Levi Strauss is uh, I'm sure a few people have seen articles in the news in which they address their own diversity issues, um, whether that was in uh, maybe monikers on a shirt or in their advertisements. What I think that they did really well was to really diverse, I would say, I guess, use a lot of diverse people in advertisements campaign um, and staff. So I'll have to applaud them for doing that. Mm -hmm. I definitely saw a lot of that um, in my years of working there. Where there was misalignment at the store level for me really came about how to deal with these issues internally. So yeah. what to do when DI conflicts arise? And that wasn't communicated to me or spoken about as broadly as I would have liked. And most of the time for us as managers, I think we need to think about, all right, what is our best approach based on some of the values of the company? So the values are there. And a lot of the time, those values do include things such as diversity and making sure things are as equitable as possible for all employees. But the best ways in which we dealt with any conflict um, was really addressing it and, and speaking with the, whether that was the sender of maybe some harsh words, maybe it was under, understanding and addressing, hey, have you checked this out? Here are some resources for you to learn more. So it wasn't much for me about reprimanding an employee for making a mistake, but also giving them the chance to learn and improve. And whether they didn't, that would be a, a further conversation. Um, but we also wanted to make sure, how do we actually support the teammates who are wronged and feel that they're, you know, undervalued or feel as though they have been a victim of discrimination or racism. Um, and of course, it's a case by case basis, but a lot of emphasis for me as a manager goes into, all right, what is it that we're doing to support those teammates and making sure that this doesn't happen again. So that sometimes were conversations where we would sit in a circle on the floor, really talk through all of the policies that we had on a company level, but then actually breaking it down for these employees. So how does, it, how does that make you feel when someone says something like this? What are the things that we can do to avoid that? And actually gathering and talking and communicating about it. Um, it it's just super important to let your employees know that mistakes will happen. You will always make a mistake, um, but it's giving people the opportunity to learn from it and to grow. That's what makes my job really exciting is feeling that, hey, I can provide that opportunity to learn. And from here on out, hopefully you might have that, that inkling in the back of your mind of, hey, this is what happened last time. How can I learn from that mistake that even if you didn't make it yourself? Um, and that's what we were hoping to achieve there. Absolutely. I think everybody's on a different part of their, their journey, especially in regards to diversity, equity, and inclusion in their work and their life in general, because if, you know, this work happens outside of the company virtually or in person. Um, and what I hear you say too is the importance of communication one, um, having two-way communication. It's not about yelling at someone and correcting them. It's about having that place of understanding, but also making sure that you know, when you know better, you do better. And it's it's just pushing that forward and having a greater impact as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about Ada's diversity, equity, inclusion strategy? I know you touched on it um, a little bit. We would love to learn more about the scope and kind of what uh, what you're looking looking forward to pushing forward there. 
Yeah, I, I feel really blessed uh, to be working in an environment at Ada, which gives me the room to think through our diversity strategy and philosophy and to talk to all of our employees. I think what Ada does really well, is, especially for anti-racism specifically in that movement, is that constant reminder that, hey, DI is the work of everybody. Everybody is involved in ensuring that we feel like this is a safer space in which we can discuss and learn and confront racism head on. And then I think the other part of that is for me, what, what really drives these, this movement is our internal discussion. So we at Ada, I think it's really interesting, our employees love to give feedback. So I don't necessarily have that problem in thinking through what are the ways in which we can improve our DI, but some of our topics that we've discussed internally, such as like performative activism, hiring, um, looking into our own employee resource group for that feedback has really driven a lot of our change. And I don't wanna say that our fundraising efforts are not a fantastic way to actively show support for these organizations that are really working to make sure that anti-racism is a movement that does not go away tomorrow. But I often hear more about the support that we give to our employees. So if you're feeling the effects of racial trauma, which can manifest itself in so many different ways, you have that opportunity to take time off. You don't need to be worrying about something you've heard in the news, something that has really deeply disturbed you, and then having to deal with work on top of that. We know that it's impossible sometimes. So I think that in, I give these reminders and these are reminders that are given to me, you have that opportunity to take time off when you need to and feel reassured that don't worry, your work is not leaving anywhere, you are supported here. Um, and that's something that our leadership team has done so well. Um, and I'm just really happy that I'm in an environment that I'm able to kind of just reiterate that statement. Like you can take that time, pause if you need to, take a break. I think it's really important. Um, that's th that mental health effects of racial trauma is something that I don't think is spoken about enough. Um, I think that we often will tell employees that, hey, this is something that's happening in the news. I know that DEI leaders will share a lot of information, but some of that information is quite heavy to digest. So I think um, that reminder of being able to feel supported, to take time off um, and to decompress is super important. I think that's a really important piece of this work too, especially for DEI professionals and also for folks who are at who are employees at the company. I think we're seeing a lot of conversations around looking at employees as a full human and as like they not work is not the only thing that they have going on and it really impacts their experience and their um, just like life in general. So making sure that companies and leaders also, like you said, recognize that is really, really important. How do you really measure the success or, you know, progress of um, all of the either kind of like, you know, trainings or benefits or just this communication as well, since um, I know just the sense of belonging is kind of hard to measure um, relatively. Right. And it, it, it almost comes full circle to what you just mentioned about thinking about employees of being a full human. <laughs> um, and that's something that we often forget. They're not robots. Yeah. And although I work at a company that is focusing on that <laughs> bot, it's just not realistic to think that once you've achieved a certain DR target or one of the action items in your strategy, that you've ultimately succeeded and that's the end. I think that for what it really boils down to is just this assessment and reassessment of a company's growth. Hey, as we're scaling, have we remeasured our demographics? Yeah. Do all of our employees feel like they're represented in the best possible fashion. I think that's important to, to know. And a companies that are high growing or scaling quickly, I think it's important for us to always have that reevaluation and give your employees that opportunity to say on a survey that they have a voice, that they have belonging, but also taking what they say in the survey and doing something with it. I think we analyze a lot of info and we can be gatekeepers of information, but it's really important for us to think about, hey, this is actually an idea that we've had. Have we explored it? Is there something that we could do better than what we're doing now? I think once, even if you've achieved high engagement in DI or in your employees feeling represented, whether you've achieved a number or a percentage that you were hoping for, it's just a going above and beyond. 
And when you're balancing the needs of an organization and stretching yourself to create new action items, new programming, other employee resource groups, I think that is the ultimate way in which you could start to actually measure your success. It takes time. It, it, there's nothing, there's nothing that I can say that will, I guess, be a clear picture of, hey, remember, you will not solve all of your issues and problems in a day. Um, but I think it's really important to continuously just have that reminder of yourself of you need to improve. And whether you think that you have achieved success, take a look around. There might be something that you've missed. Um, and, and I think that's just something that I try to keep in my in top of mind if, uh, as I'm thinking about how our own culture will evolve and continue to evolve. Yeah, absolutely. Especially as the company begins to scale and grow as well, and you're welcoming new folks and people start to be at the company for a couple of years now, it's really merging those two cultures and building something new together. And also, like you said, the qualitative data piece of asking employees and continuously asking and not only asking, but doing based on what you hear is really important as well. And based on the feedback that they give or the way an initiative lands or doesn't land, when you are innovating in this space or just with anything, you're bound to make mistakes. And this doesn't have to be ADA specific or even at companies you've worked at in the past, it could be in the news or what have you, but are there any common mistakes you see in regards to DEI strategies, just really falling flat or um, just like common even myths or misconceptions there? Yeah, that, this is a great question. I think the most common mistake in how, even I guess DI can even be taught is in thinking just about the D and DI. If we're thinking just about mm -hmm. diversity, I think yeah. for a lot of companies and perhaps this is just their performative nature. I think that they think that bringing people who are diverse in the workplace is enough. Um, mm -hmm. And they hope that everything else will fall into place afterwards, but we need to really ensure that those systems for equity and inclusion are just as important. Um, and hiring is just one piece of a, up the pie. There's a lot that goes into it. And I think for my, I think that inclusion is something that's really hard to achieve and measure, which is why it should definitely be just as much as a focus as diversity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think having that like equity piece and inclusion is so, so important. And you can't just, you know, think that you can bring on all these different people from different backgrounds and then have it work out and just like you'll retain these people without having an intentional strategy too, um, and ensuring you're, again, you're having that two-way communication, you're keeping a pulse on everyone's experiences because it just doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight like, like that. Um, if there is anything that you would point to in terms of your experience to really create an environment that is inclusive, is there anything that you would say is like really key in terms of pieces of the puzzle to ensure that employees feel heard and seen? Yeah, I think that from just based on my past experience and learning about inclusivity, I think that a lot of the time where our leaders or um, maybe our people ops teams will really think about what they believe mm -hmm. is what inclusive culture is and tell their employees, this is what it means. Do you feel included or not? So I think we need to work backwards sometimes. And as DI leaders, something that I would even remind myself is, have we asked? For who, have we communicated with them? What do they believe is inclusive? Do they have an understanding of what inclusivity is? Most definitely. So we're probably not letting uh, our, all of our employees very often think about what that means. And when we're not asking questions about what it is that it means, and we're just measuring it and saying we've achieved it, that's how you leave people out, right? This is what ex exclusion is. You're not allowing those people to have influence on that decision of what inclusive culture is, and then they're not able to partake in it, and they're not able to continue to grow inclusive culture. Okay. If you're thinking about inclusivity as, okay, it's a measurement, it's something that is in diversity, equity, inclusion, okay, what are the different people or what are the different voices that need to be involved to make this happen? Everybody. So yeah. I think that that's something that it could be completely missed. And what's really important is to have a, an opportunity or venue for people to really think about and talk about inclusivity. And I think that it's something that I talk about very often during onboarding at Ada, but then when in my past life, never was a conversation. We didn't focus on inclu inclusion. Um, and again, it, the focus was kind of brought back to diversity and to think about how great it is that we're diverse. 
but as a diverse person in a space that might not always be as diverse, mm-hmm. how does how was that conversation uh, brought back to the question of what is it that we mean by this? What is it that inclusion means to us? Uh, and I think there's just a messaging around that needs to be changed. Inclusion and belonging needs to really be side by side with a D and E in the DEI uh, acronym. And I think that we need to remember that we need to be constantly asking employees how they feel and measuring it and to really talk to them about the ways in which we can change. I think thinking critically is is a big piece here because especially as more companies and rightfully so too think about diversity, equity, inclusion, they're thinking about hiring DEIB program managers, a chief diversity officer, and especially in tech too, there are so many buzzwords and acronyms. I think digging into what do we really mean by that and what do we really want to create, like you said, is is really, really critical to thinking about something that's actually going to make a long, long-term uh, impact. Um, shifting the conversation just a little bit to your experience, like what do you really value in your teammates and like coworkers in terms of characteristics? Yeah, no, this is a great question. Uh, and when I originally read this question list, I was like, great question. <laughs> uh, so I think what, you know, it's interesting when you're thinking about a coworker, another person you're working with, For me, the one thing that came, like the first thing that came to my mind and something that I'm like, yep, that's it, it's authenticity. I think that people are not always able, even legally, to have that opportunity to be themselves in every way. So I really try to lean into, as much as I can, I really make that extra effort to make people feel like they can put themselves on display a bit. I want people to feel comfortable and and I love working with people who are proud to say how they feel and to challenge the status quo. Um, And just, I like to celebrate uniqueness. So that is something that I really value is someone who can be really authentic and honest um, in in sharing their ideas and opinions. Yeah, I I definitely agree with that as well. That's something that I definitely value in in coworkers and teammates of mine too. And I think being authentic and being honest relates to building trust too with with your teammates and having that communication so you can have hard conversations, but also celebrate each other as well. So I love that. Yeah. And I think that what's interesting about celebrating people being who they are, a lot of different organizations will say that we love your authenticity, but we'd rather you hold your opinion. So (laughs) we need to always, I think, come back to as DI leaders or people leaders in general, we need to really think about when we're saying that we want people to be authentic, that means that that's all sides of them, not just the sides that you like. Yes, when it's convenient for for you or, you know, what you mean by that because you're at this point. Yeah, right. I definitely, definitely agree with that too. Is there anything you're seeing in just the DEI realm or world in terms of trends or thoughts that you think companies and individuals really need to hone in on to be successful in the future? Or I guess another way of asking that is, is there something that people are missing as part of the, the conversation around DEI? Right. That's a, no, that's another good question. I think what has been really exciting to see and a lot of positive trends are a lot of new job postings that I've been seeing on LinkedIn for positions in DI leadership or yeah. specialist roles, which I think is incredible. I think you need that to help guide your company's mission. Uh, I'll say a negative trend uh, really that relates to that is relying on predominantly people of color yes. or other folks of underrepresented groups to be that sole face of DEI for the organization. Um, So they're thinking about filling seats, they're thinking about filling the positions of people that might look, quote unquote, the part. Um, But I think they are not the only people who should be managing DEI. As I mentioned a few times here, DEI is everybody's job, whether you're the head of diversity or not. You're you're here to help guide the mission, but um, you're guiding this company's mission in mind, you have to also think about yourself. How, how, how can I be the sole face of DI? How can I really align our team and make sure that they feel comfortable in partaking in DI just as much as I am? Yeah, and I think that's empowerment piece too and measuring kind of the impacts that you, you have is just you don't have to go to one person and you don't have to be that sole person to educate and be there for hundreds of people. That's a lot of work and that's very right. unrealistic to... To do and also to think of hiring someone when you're seeing, because I'm seeing these job postings as well um, as chief diversity officer or, you know, specialist to say, mm-hmm. okay, we, we have like checked the box here. So we're all, we're all good. Again, going back to your earlier point, it's not, 
you have to continue to work on this and having someone in the role is great because I believe it, it is a full-time job, but it's also, it's not your end all be all to, to fix all of everything. Exactly. Totally. I totally yeah. agree. I know that we talked about a couple of different topics from your passion from being in the space, um, working at Ada and the support you've received there and just some of your past experience as well, what you're seeing in, in the market today. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you really want to share with our listeners or just a key takeaway you want to emphasize um, before we, we part ways? Yeah, I think the the message that I hope that, and I love this series and I really hope that other DI leaders will continue to share their stories and to reach out to one another, um, to really collaborate and work on fixing all of these systemic issues um, from the inside out. I think it's super important. Um, what I would also say to DI leaders is to, don't forget, have those conversations with your teammates as well. Continuously find that time or office hour where you can chat about DEI and make people really feel a part of the conversation and a part of growing and building that change that you want to see in your organization. Um, and then apart from that, for all the other listeners, I just wanted to say, hopefully everyone is well, happy Pride and happy National Indigenous uh, History Month. Yes, amazing, amazing. Thank you so much for your time and holding space for this conversation and talking about your story and being uh, a bit vulnerable too. I, I really appreciate it. And it was it was really nice to meet you for the first time as well. Yeah, it's so nice to meet you. And thank you so much for letting me share my story. Yes, absolutely. I appreciate the work you're doing. And as a reminder, All Voices believes in the empowerment of everyone to speak up and provide feedback at an organization. And we believe that it's a requirement in order for everyone to succeed. So we will speak soon. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.